good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nirav Shah. I'm the director of the State of Maine Center for Disease Control and Prevention. I'm joined this afternoon by Governor Janet Mills, Commissioner Jean Lambrew of Maine's Department of Health and Human Services, and Dan Brennan, Director of Maine Housing. We're here today to provide everyone an update on the COVID-19 situation across the state of Maine for today, Thursday, July 30th, 2020. I'm gonna provide a quick epidemiological update and then turn things over to Governor Mills. Right now in the state of Maine, there are 3,888 total cases of COVID-19, representing an increase of 22 cases since yesterday. Of those cases, 3,477 are confirmed and 411 are probable. Our update, our update today includes an unfortunate piece of sad news, which is that another individual in Maine, a man in his 80s from Kennebec County, has passed away with COVID-19. His passing represents the 122nd death associated with COVID-19 and comes at a time when the United States itself has surpassed over 150,000 deaths nationwide. We, all of us, offer this individual's friends, families, and communities our condolences during this time of their grieving. Right now in Maine, there are 11 individuals who are currently hospitalized, eight of whom are in the ICU and three of whom are on ventilators. To put that number in a bit of perspective, adjusted for our population in Maine, our hospitalization rate is approximately one person for every 100,000 people in Maine. The nationwide rate of hospitalization right now is 18 people for every 100,000 nationwide. Overall in the state, 3,345 individuals have recovered and of our cases, 892 are healthcare workers. As we've talked about previously, Maine CDC staff have been fielding a number of consults from healthcare workers across the state. That number is close to 11,100. In addition, our colleagues at 211 have been answering calls and questions from all of you since early on in our response to the pandemic. As of yesterday, our friends at 211 had answered nearly 29,000 calls from Maine people to field their questions about everything going on with COVID-19. We really do thank our friends at 211 for joining up with us to help get as many people as possible answers to their COVID-19 questions. A few brief updates on some of the outbreaks that Maine CDC is involved with. The first is one at Central Maine Medical Center, where there are a total of 14 positive cases, 12 among staff members and two among patients associated with this outbreak. Maine CDC has been working closely with CMMC, and that facility is planning to retest selected members of their medical team, their entire staff, as the week goes on to see what the progress has been in the COVID-19 situation there. As we have updates and data from that second round of testing, we'll make sure we share it with everybody. Also at, Han <clears throat> at Hancock Farms, there are now a total of eight staff members who have tested positive for COVID-19. We continue to work with that farm to make sure that the individuals who have tested positive have a safe place that they can recuperate and as well as working with that farm to conduct another round of testing in the near future. Also at the Marshwood Center in Lewiston, that facility recently undertook a round of universal testing and the results from that round of testing should be available later today. Finally, at Sedgwood Commons in Falmouth, where there have been a total of 57 cases thus far, that facility as well has been undertaking rounds of universal testing. Just this morning, the results from their residents came back and all of the residents at Sedgwood Commons have tested negative. We should have additional data on their staff testing very soon. And finally, earlier this morning, Maine CDC opened an outbreak investigation into Merrill Blueberry Farms in Ellsworth, where there are a total of three individual workers at that farm 
who have tested positive for COVID-19. Before I turn things over to Governor Mills, a few updates on our data, specifically with respect to testing. Based on 2,725 PCR tests reported to Maine CDC yesterday, the one day point positivity rate was 0.62%. That brings our seven day weighted positivity average to back under 1% to 0.95% to be precise. For comparison, the nationwide positivity rate stands at 8%. Finally, a brief update on our overall testing volume. Right now in Maine, the number of tests being conducted per 100,000 individuals stands at 181 tests on a seven day basis for every 100,000 individuals in Maine. We still have more work to do to increase that number and the increasing availability and online nature of or going online of swab and send sites should help make testing more available across the state and hopefully increase the access to testing for more and more people statewide. So with that, Governor Mills, I'd like to turn things over to you. Thank you, and I am unmuted. Thank you very much, Dr. Shaw for your detailed uh, news, your daily update, always so informative um, and many days um, heartwarming and inspiring. Um, I, I just wanna thank the people of Maine, first of all, for their incredible cooperation, for their patience, for their courage. They all have taken to, turn to and taken the steps that were required, continue to take, to take those steps to protect the health and safety of all Maine people wearing face coverings, not always without controversy, adapting businesses to safely uh, serve customers and encouraging friends and family members to get tested and to quarantine if they visit our state, if they can't get a test. All of these steps have contributed to our low positivity rate, which Dr. Shaw just described. And it has allowed, these steps have allowed our economy to reopen gradually, but safely so far, but we're not out of the woods as we keep saying, we can't yield. The deadly virus is still here and we're not immune from the surges that we've seen in other states. I want Maine people to be healthy. I want the economy to become strong again. Oops, screen, screen went down. And uh, to expand our economy as well. Economists and public health experts, um, Many business owners who write to me every day say, the best thing we can do for our economic health is to protect our public health. We can keep trying to continue to strike that balance and it's not easy. Uh, for instance, you know, many main people are still experiencing financial hardship as a result of COVID-19, which is impacting their ability to pay rent. The last thing main people need to, to worry about in the middle of a pandemic is losing their home so in April, at my urging, Maine Housing established a rent relief program to help keep people in their homes. Under that program, each household that met certain requirements was eligible to receive up to $500 in rental assistance that was paid directly to their landlord, in exchange for which the landlord agreed to not to commence eviction proceedings for that month. I wanna thank uh, Maine Housing uh, for their partnership in this, uh, this area. We did not use any general fund monies for this program, um, but now it's come time to look at that again. As of July 16th, 6,750 applications for rent relief have been approved under that program for a total of more than $3.3 million in direct relief to Maine people and several thousand applications for rent relief are still pending and in process going out the door. At that time, I also signed an executive order that when taken in combination with a March 18th order by the Maine Supreme Judicial Court, prevented, effectively prevented the immediate eviction of tenants who were unable to pay their rent due to COVID-19 related financial issues. Well, and you will remember that that was at the time when our strict stay at home order was in effect as well. So we were telling people not to leave their homes and people were losing their jobs in droves and filing for unemployment. It was an important time to keep people in their homes. 
As the Maine Supreme Judicial Court now plans to reopen courts for filings next week, and as the federal government appears to be poised to reducing unemployment benefits, or at least the $600 a week of unemployment assistance, I'm very concerned that Maine people will be facing a housing cliff, as it were, losing income and also losing rent relief and becoming subject to eviction. So today, I'm dedicating another $5 million in federal coronavirus relief funds to the COVID-19 rental relief program in order to expand this rental assistance for Maine people in several ways. So with those funds starting uh, next Monday, August 3rd, Maine Housing will double its rental assistance payments available from $500 a month to $1,000 a month. Eligible households will receive up to $1,000 in rental assistance for up to three months. And that assistance may also be used to pay arrearages and I believe in some cases utilities when it's part of the rent. So accepting, in accepting that payment, the landlord will agree not to evict the tenant for non-payment for the month the payment was issued. We consider this $5 million uh, to be an initial investment. Given the limited federal funding Maine has remaining compared to the expansive needs across the state and across many sectors of our economy, we conferred with Maine Housing and decided to offer this $5 million as a starting point. We continue to evaluate the needs and we're hopeful that there'll be additional support from the federal government, which I continue to advocate for, of course. I'm also signing an executive order today, number five for this fiscal year. And this executive order continues some of the expanded timeframes and protections for renters in the eviction process. While the court system reopens, this new order will continue some measure of protection for renters who are at will or month to month renters. The order requires a landlord for them to, a landlord to provide at least 45 days notice for a notice to quit rather than 30 days under law. And if the landlord is attempting to evict a residential tenant uh, for arrearages, the order increases an eviction notice from seven days to 30 days, giving the renter more time to collect funds um, and pay the rent. This order also maintains strength and penalties for landlords who might try to evict tenants by unlawful means, such as turning off the utilities. We hope this expanded rent rental relief program and the continued protections contained in the updated executive order will help renters and landlords alike during the continued pandemic. Also, earlier today, Maine Department of Health and Human Services announced a $1 million grant to significantly and quickly expand education, prevention, and other services from housing to quarantine supports to reduce the disproportionate racial and ethnic COVID-19 disparities in our state. This funding will go directly to the community-based organization organizations, uh, those who have their boots on the ground to protect and assist people in their own communities and to encourage testing and prevention measures. These new resources will help secure and protect housing and serve the health and safety of Maine people during the COVID-19 pandemic. We're not letting up. More information about the rental relief program, eligibility requirements, application materials, we're trying to keep it simple and statistics about the program and frequently asked correct questions can be found at mainhousing.org backslash COVID rent. I urge anyone anywhere in the state of Maine who's struggling to pay their rent to apply for this immediate assistance. And I wanna thank again the Maine people for their cooperation during this pandemic, your continued patience as we deal with school, school opening issues and the continued tourism issues and the economic issues we're dealing with things every hour, every day. It's so important to have the support and continued cooperation of the people of Maine. Now I'd like to simply welcome Dan Brennan, Director of Maine Housing. Perhaps you can say a few words about the Rental Relief Program. Dan? Sure, thank you very much, Governor. Um, I appreciate those comments. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, first of all, I'd like to start off by thanking you, Governor, for your continued support of affordable housing efforts here in Maine and for your partnership with us in April to make the COVID-19 rent relief program stand up so quickly in the early days of the pandemic. And as you mentioned, at the end of the day, we will help, have helped nearly 10,000 people with that uh, $500 uh, 
uh, assistance. Um, we're grateful for the CARES Act funding, and we're also grateful to the uh, Commissioner Johnson and the Department of Economic and Community Development, who's also helping us out with rental assistance funding. You know, as the pandemic continues, uh, we know that Mainers uh, will need more help. Unemployment is high. Many who are back to work aren't back full time. And uncertainty does remain about the future federal assistance that's coming. To no one's surprise, rental delinquencies have increased since March. And Mainers who are paying their rent are stressing the financial health of their households in doing so. Savings, if any, are drying up. Credit cards are being tapped and difficult decisions about whether to pay for food or medicine or housing costs are having to be made. We think this is only gonna get worse as the pandemic continues. So as the governor said in response, we are expanding the COVID-19 rent relief program to offer more assistance again. We're gonna go from 500 up to $1,000 a month and that will be available for up to three months. It can be used for back rent and if you applied to the $500 program, which is still gonna be available through five o'clock tomorrow, you can also apply to this expanded program. The additional requirements, as the governor mentioned, are gonna be on our website, mainhousing.org backslash COVID rent. We're gonna start taking these applications on Monday, August 3rd. Again, everything is on our website, mainhousing.org backslash COVID rent. And if you have a hard time getting to a computer, you can call 211. Uh, we wouldn't be able to do this program without our partnerships with Maine's community action agencies throughout the state. They're absolutely vital to the distribution of the program and we thank them for their work to date and the work that they will do in the future. And all of us here at Maine Housing are happy to continue to be able to help Mainers in this time of need. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dan. Thank you very much, Governor. Uh, we're going to turn over to our colleagues in the media for some questions. And today's first question goes to Jay Mishkin from WGME. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much. Uh, I have two questions. First one is about uh, the schools tomorrow. So I'm wondering if the school systems have already been aware of what their red, yellow, and green designations are going to be. And if, from what you know about it, if anybody, any surprises are going to come out where school systems are going to be surprised, or counties rather, are going to be surprised of what the designation is. Cool. Let me sure. just say, maybe I can say that Commissioner Macon has been working very closely with all the school districts uh, for several months on this issue right now. And uh, I don't think there's going to be any surprises, but I'll, I'll let uh, Dr. Shah respond to the analysis that's being done, perhaps. The, the analysis is underway. It has not been released to schools. Um, and I can't speak to whether there will be any surprises, but we're going to follow the numbers and release everything tomorrow. Okay. Uh, one more. Um, if you look at uh, our numbers in the state over the past month, the greatest increase in age groups are those that are under 20 and those in their 20s, which sort of matches what's going on nationwide. Several other states, including New Jersey, are blaming house parties as one of the top cases, either bars or house parties. Obviously, our bar situation is different than many other states, but do we have any documented cases of COVID spread at social events or house parties in Maine? Um, so Jay, we, you know, as, we, as we undertake contact tracing, one of the things that we do is ask folks where they've been and then look for patterns among that. Uh, we haven't traced a large number of cases to any specific gatherings yet, although there are some that our teams are working on trying to make some additional connections to. We haven't identified a singular one yet, although that investigation is still underway. But you're correct as to the increase of cases among younger individuals. I think that points the way at two real strong pieces of advice. The, folk, the first is that younger folks can get COVID-19. There's a sense out there that COVID-19 only affects and really only disproportionately uh, makes ill individuals who are older. And they still comprise the bulk of cases, but we've seen a growth of COVID-19 cases nationwide, in Maine included, among younger individuals. The second is that congregation, density, uh, uh, getting together, is an opportunity to spread the disease. We've seen that across the country. And so for younger folks out there right now, the way that you go about your, your nights and your weekends and how you spend time with your friends can introduce risk. And that's a risk that you could inadvertently bring back to your family, your grandparents, other members, folks that are around you and inadvertently infect. I'm gonna turn next to Amy Brown over at WERU. 
Thank you, Dr. Shah. Uh, first, just a quick follow-up regarding Sedgwick Commons. You said that in the second round, all have tested negative. Do, have the 57 people who previously tested positive there all recovered? Uh, so all the residents have tested negative in this latest wow. round. They've actually been undertaking multiple rounds uh, of testing. We're waiting for the latest results from their staff testing. But this is part of an ongoing effort at Sedgwood to conduct multiple rounds of testing. In terms of the 57 individuals, um, I'm, I'm not sure if all of them have recovered. We'll get you that exact number um, in, in, in terms of the exact number in that outbreak who have recovered. Um, but just to be clear, this is not the second round. It's just the latest in multiple rounds of testing. Okay, thank you. And my, the question I was initially going to ask is, what kind of outreach is being done to the migrant farm worker community and how mm -hmm. are positive tests among migrant farm workers being reported? Are they uh, included in our numbers or are they treated as out of state and recorded that way? And are the migrant workers required to follow the quarantine or have a negative test before they start working in Maine? I'll take those in reverse order, Amy. The answer to your last question is yes. They are required to follow the governor's executive orders uh, with respect to either quarantining or getting a negative test. In many cases, it's both. That negative test, as a reminder, can be taken once someone arrives in Maine, provided that they quarantine until such time the test result is come back. The second question or the middle question you asked is how are cases in this situation being counted? What we have found working with our partners on the ground is that most uh, most migrant agricultural workers list their state, the state that they are currently in, in this case, Maine, as their state of residence. Uh, in many cases, they intend to be uh, in the state in Maine for several weeks throughout the growing and then the harvesting season. So given that they themselves indicate that their state of residence is Maine, we count them as part of Maine's cases. And then in terms of outreach, uh, I'm glad you asked that that we've worked very closely with our colleagues and partners at Maine Mobile Health over the past several months. This is what Maine Mobile Health does. They specialize in outreach to populations such as migrant agricultural workers who are arriving into the state and they do so in partnership with growers so that when groups of migrant agricultural workers arrive, they can be quickly tested and then if they test positive, provided safe supportive isolation. And if they test negative, they can start their job and make sure that they're doing what they need to do uh, with, with their communities as well. So that, that type of outreach is not just focused on COVID-19, I should note. It's focused on their entire panoply of health concerns. So it's chronic diseases, diabetes, uh, uh, heart disease, hypertension, as well as COVID-19. And that outreach is very much proactive. It's important to note, Amy, that the results that I've mentioned uh, from yesterday, uh, from Tuesday as well as today, are the result of proactive testing, not reactive testing. And that's because of the partnership we've got with Maine Mobile Health. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna turn next to Bob Evans at News Center. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. We've heard from viewers and a staff member, this is for you, by the way, that they were, um, that they were tested for the virus more than 10 days ago and are still waiting for results. They were told a backlog of tests are delaying results. Could more testing being done mean more delays? And should people ask who are being tested, ask where the tests will be processed in case that makes a difference in the timing? Sure, so Bob, what we've seen nationwide is that because of significant increases in cases pretty much everywhere else, the national laboratories that process a large number of these tests, Quest, LabCorp, groups like that, have been inundated with tests and have thus entered, they, they, they've thus uh, had a backlog and a slowdown in the return of tests back to individuals. The state laboratory here in Augusta has no such backlog and remains able to receive, process, and report out results quickly. But at a certain point, what we've seen is that these delays, as you've noted, have stretched on more than seven days. For that reason, it's not a bad idea to ask your provider where your test might be done, or at a minimum, ask your provider what she thinks the expected turnaround time might be. One of the reasons, one of the ways that we've set up the swab and send sites is that they will use the main state laboratory up here in Augusta. 
in the hope that that turnaround time will be as low as possible. We know that what's important when it comes to COVID-19 is not just when you get tested, but how long it takes for you to get your result. If you're positive, you need to take immediate action to make sure you stay in isolation and avoid infecting others. So that turnaround time is really critical. By utilizing the swab and send sites, partnering with the main state laboratory, we hope to provide an option for Maine people to get tested with a low turnaround time. Commissioner Lambrou, is there anything else? Okay. Um, and I have a question from my colleague, Don Kerrigan for the commissioner. Um, DHHS and York Hospital set up a rapid testing site, primarily to help test tourists coming to Maine. But the demand for testing has been far more than the capacity. And now there is a two week waiting period to get an appointment. Why hasn't the state set up more of these sites in York County tourist areas or in other prime tourist spots? Sure. We have been happy to have that partnership with York Hospital in which we are lending them those platforms that they're using to be conducting this testing. And we have lent them what we have. We don't have any more test platforms to lend because in part we're using those same rapid tests called the ID Now for what we just heard about. May Mobile Health uses them to test some of the workers coming in. We use them at sites where we want to make sure there's no imminent outbreak. So we have lent them what we have. We are looking to see if there are more platforms that we could deploy to that area. And we appreciate the fact that there's high demand. But as a reminder, we are opening up these other sites, these so-called swap and sends that we hope to open up more in your county in the coming days. Uh, certainly more in Southern Maine, where we know a lot of people are, because we appreciate the fact that demand is high. I'm going to turn now to Brooke Riley at ABC7. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Now, going back to the school topic, um, should parents have concern about potentially sending their kids back to school in just a few weeks now? Sorry, Brooke, I want to make sure I heard you. Your question was whether parents should have concerns? Yes. What kind of concerns should they have? Sure. Um, well, you know what? I think this will be a good topic that I know will be discussed at length tomorrow as well. But I, I, I certainly understand that parents out there, to say nothing of teachers and other staff at schools, have concerns about going back into classroom settings for the school year. What the Department of Education has really set up is a system whereby if it's not safe to return to the classroom in the judgment of local school officials based on what they're seeing on the ground, there are alternatives in place, whether that be hybrid education or fully going online. But certainly we understand that everyone out there is expressing concerns. Right now in Maine, although infection levels statewide remain low, that could change. One of the things that we at the Maine CDC and DHHS are doing is keeping constant tabs on those data. We intend to update those data on our website so that everyone can see what's going on in their county with respect to COVID-19 and help use that in concert with school officials, pediatricians, family physicians to make determinations about what's best for their own family. This is a situation where every family will have to approach going back to school in potentially different ways based on what's going on at home, based on health conditions the child may have, based on what's going on in the community. We certainly understand those concerns. We know that everyone share that, shares those right now. We want to equip everyone with all the data that we've got as they go about making these decisions. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to turn next to Kate Koff at the Ellsworth American. Thanks, Dr. Shah. Um, two questions, uh, both for you and uh, unrelated to one another. Um, the first is, I'm wondering if you can give us any more details about the cases at uh, Merrill Blueberry Farms, um, such as, you know, were those cases among migrant workers and are those workers being quarantined apart from other staff? Sure. Um, we just opened our investigation into that situation this morning. So the investigation is underway. We're not commenting on anything related to not just in this outbreak, but in any outbreak. We're not commenting on any of the specifics as to the individuals who might be affected. What I can tell you, uh, though, Kate, is that in general, our approach to any outbreak situation in a congregate setting is to make sure that individuals who have tested positive, as well as their close contacts, 
are provided safe places where they can remain apart from others so as to avoid any further transmission of disease. That's the approach we take in all types of congregate settings, farm workers and all others included. Thank you. Um, and then the second one is, um, you know, we've we've he been hearing that there's a bit of a delay in setting up the, some of the swab and send testing sites. Um, we're hearing that particularly at sites uh, affiliated with the Northern Light Hospital Group. Um, so I'm wondering if you can tell us, you know, has the partnership with Northern Light been finalized? And is there any change in when those sites will be up and running and who can get tested there? Commissioner yeah. Lambert? Yep. Yeah, we've had an excellent partner, partnership with Northern Light. They really have been helping throughout this pandemic, including in circumstances where they have some of their nurses who have been helping to take those samples when we have outbreaks at different sites. So they are, they are working hard on standing up these sites. My understanding is they are tentatively aiming to open up their 10 site, sites across the state of Maine on Monday. Obviously, we're going to work with them to make sure that, that works well, but we expect to significantly expand our capacity on Monday. But we will, again, make sure that all the systems work before we push the green light to say go. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kate. Uh, I'm going to turn next to Kevin Miller at the Press Herald. Great. I have two questions on the racial disparity, um, the funding for racial disparity um, issues. I guess the first probably to Governor Mills. Uh, Governor, a few weeks ago when leaders of some of the immigrant groups and uh, held a kind of virtual press conference, they, they asked for, for a meeting with you. Uh, did that meeting ever happen either um, virtually or, or in person? And if so, can you just tell us a little bit about kind of what, what you guys discussed there? Yes, it did, Kevin. Uh, we met, I think, about two weeks ago, not, not quite two weeks ago. Uh, and um, it was a productive discussion, um, five or six individuals. And I did uh, take time one evening, one weekend, to watch the entire hour and a half plus um, press conference that they did, the video um, of that. Uh, and uh, I was impressed by what some of the local organizations are doing. And, so what are the, and some of the challenges they're having as well. Uh, and it's it's disheartening and I think unacceptable that we're seeing, uh, confronting a significant um, number of racial, significant racial disparities, to put it that way. And um, what this pandemic has laid bare about some of the inequities and the racism in our society. And they, these issues deserve our attention, both in the short run and the long run. In the short run, I'm impressed with what some of the people like Mufala and Fatuma are doing in their communities to encourage people to get tested who otherwise, because of cultural issues, may be afraid to get tested or may not be able to lose their jobs, not be able to take time off from work and have families to support. Uh, getting people tested is a big, uh, big barrier in some of the communities. And then when they are tested, and if they are positive, making sure they have a um, facility for quarantining that doesn't isolate them totally from their families, um, from their cultural in underpinnings, uh, and um, getting masks out into the communities, those kinds of things. So that's what this money will help do directly to the, to the uh, um, community-based organizations who are, who are members of that same community. Um, and, and I think that'd be effective. We want to make sure everybody has access to services, including wraparound services, so that if they test positive, they don't have to worry about feeding their children, don't have to worry about temporary housing, don't have to worry about other services that are so vital to keep those families together and keep people safe and healthy and minimize the spread to other communities. Great, and I think you, you answered part of, part of that, but maybe uh, Commissioner Lambert might uh, have a, a little bit more details. I just wanted to find out if you can provide some additional examples of how this money might be used. You, you mentioned you know, money for food or for childcare. Are there other examples that you can provide, either you or the commissioner? Yeah, so what we have heard, and we have been listening because many of these needs are identified by these community-based organizations, are there's, first of all, a need to get out there early. There are a lot of people who think that they might have COVID-19 in these communities, but as the governor said, for different systemic reasons are not getting tested. 
they need support, they need education, they need to know how to get tested. So catching people early is part of what this new funding can do, as well as making sure that as they are recovering, they have all the services and supports they need to recover. We also want to make sure that there might, might be services that we're missing that would be that key to keep somebody in isolation or quarantine because as a reminder, it's not easy to do that. You're se separated from your family, your friends. Some of these people um, don't speak English, so that's another barrier. So we are trying to make sure that we are giving the types of supports that these communities identify. But I do want to emphasize that the different part of what we're doing today is really working in partnerships because what we have heard loud and clear is that the community members can identify these needs, they can provide these services, and we want to take down barriers and make sure we're supporting them in doing so. And that includes new Mainers, it includes African American people who have been here for generations, it includes the Latinx community. We have some people from East, you know, Asia. So we really have a diverse set of communities. There's not just one. We want to make sure we're supporting them all. Great, thank you so much. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, I'm going to turn to Emily Tadlock at WABI next. Thank you. So um, my first question maybe is for you, Dr. Shaw and um, Governor Mills. There's, we've heard from a couple of different companies, there's worry of hiring migrant workers now because of the virus and because of their concerns of bringing it into their facilities, their farms um, and, and such. But without them finding local employees to help them is very difficult as well um, to be able to get the job done. So what would you say to um, to these places looking to hire migrant workers um, and who, who are worried about this? Uh, let me just start by saying, I think we've had migrant workers coming to Maine for some for a number of months and we have not had uh, until just very recently uh, any serious concerns about COVID among that population. To the extent we detect it, we'll obviously respond as we would in any other manner with any other population. Um, they are, people coming to the state should be tested. That's my executive order. Uh, they are being tested. Uh, and when they test positive, we're uh, quar quarantining and their employers are quarantining them. Um, so I don't know that there's justification for employers to be fearful of migrant labor per se. Um, more than any other uh, group that whom they might seek uh, to employ. I, I would I would agree, uh, Governor. My my advice to any any organization out there would be to think about agricultural farm workers in the same way that you might think about any worker coming from another part of the country, which is to say that because of the relative risk of being from other parts of the country, there's the possibility that anybody, be they be a worker or a tourist. Uh, could potentially be bringing COVID. And so making sure they get tested as, as they arrive, ideally before, but in many cases as they arrive. And then if that's not feasible, asking them to quarantine before they're uh, interacting with others so that the likelihood of prompting an outbreak goes down significantly. I think if we, if we think about them as being in the, same, uh, in the same category as we think of any out-of-state worker, any out-of-state person, that's really the best way. And there's nothing unique about them. They're just folks who might have been in another part of the country where there's more COVID circulating. We've got systems in place working again with partners like Maine Mobile Health, to make sure that testing is made available and broader healthcare needs are taken care of. Thank you. I just want to clarify that's kind of what I meant was by migrant workers. We're not just ones out of the country, but out of the state as well, which is why I said hiring local employees might be difficult. I just wanted to clarify my question there, make sure that was understandable. Oh, absolutely understood. Yep. And in okay. that respect, they are, they're, 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 as would be the case with anyone from another state that's not among the five that have been exempted, uh, the, same pro the same approach from an epidemiological standpoint, as well as from a procedural standpoint applies. Okay, great. And then um, my other question is about um, this rent relief program. Um, I'm just looking at this from different perspectives. Um, from the landlord perspective, um, you know, some some of those landlords are really struggling too because these rent payments help supplement their income and help pay their mortgage um, and help pay for the places where they live as well. Um, and I know uh, I've, I have a couple of friends who own different places, but. It, 
going without this hasn't been easy and not being able to evict. Obviously, they don't want to have to evict anyone because they're everybody's struggling. But in order to get these payments, um, you know, is there anything that a landlord could do? They're also worried about going against the laws is there anything a landlord can do to make sure that this rent relief is taken advantage of maybe? Good question, if I may butt in here and answer, or try to answer, and Dan can answer as well, perhaps. You know, we've been balancing these interests, uh, trying to do this very, uh, very um, strategically. Um, I know that some landlords have actually forgiven rent and wanted people to stay when they were good tenants and didn't want to evict them for non-payment. And we've had uh, actually had some tenants apply for the rent relief, and the landlords say no. I'm just, I just don't want them to leave and I'm not going to evict them and, and uh, save you money for somebody else. And, on, and some, there are good tenants and bad tenants, good landlords, bad lo- landlords. Um, we also know that the courts want to reopen um, with some support from the state in terms of protections and precautions. In the coming months, there will be hearings, there will be ev- eviction or FED uh, complaints filed in the courts for a v- variety of reasons they're going to go forward. What we're saying is if it's for financial reasons that uh, somebody's in arrears on the rent, we wanna give a little more lead time, a little more notice uh, from seven days notice to 30 days notice for uh, the person to be able to make the rent or negotiate in good faith with the landlords, the landlord um, and get up to date on the rent. Uh, but at the same time, have this fund, these funds available for those who can't pay the rent. When we talked about seeing, figuring out a way that the landlord could apply for this rent relief program, uh, that didn't seem feasible because it's really relying on the renters financial, or maybe several renters in one apartment, one house, their financial resources, their income, to which the landlord is not necessarily privy. So um, it really behooves the tenant in these circumstances to apply for this. We're trying to make it a real simple process. We succeeded before and I think we'll succeed again. Uh, Make it easy and accessible, no strings attached, just apply for the money, tell us your income in in a confidential form uh, and we pay the rent on your behalf to the landlord. And the risk right now is in the coming months, there will be eviction proceedings. There'll be some delay in them, but there will be eviction proceedings um, we're trying to balance those interests, both sides. Uh, also, also, Governor, um, we've been working with the court system and also with landlord association um, representatives. Uh, we need landlords in Maine, and we care about uh, their businesses, and, and they provide the housing that, that we live in. Um, so we've been working with the courts, and as uh, you know, during a pandemic, sometimes people don't make decisions that are in their best interests. Well, now we have an opportunity with this program to uh, incent landlords and the tenants to work together. And I think by working with the courts and putting some language in some of the initial notices that go out to parties that are uh, heading towards eviction, we can intervene early and resolve situations before they even get to the court. So we're hopeful that we can Good. achieve that. I'll add that um, the first thing that happens in an eviction proceeding I mean, I want people to talk to their landlords. I want landlords to talk to their tenants. If there's something else going on, address that. If there's a behavioral issue or domestic violence, drugs or anything like that, please address that. Both sides should be um, willing to address those issues. If, if it's a pure non-payment, an eviction notice may may issue. Um, when the complaint is uh, filed in court and served on the renter, the first thing the court will schedule is a mediation. At that point, I hope if it hasn't been addressed before, somebody will say, hey, look, there's this rental relief program. Why don't you go for that? Uh, and um, hopefully we'll, we'll be involved at that process, that, at that level as well. Thank you. Thank you. you bet. Uh, up next is Steve Betts at the Courier Gazette. Yes, hello, Dr. Shaw. Uh, my question is, could I get more details on how the classifications will be released tomorrow? concerning school reopenings. Is it gonna be emailed to districts? And then is there some way for the public and for the media to see what those classifications are? Uh, So 
when you the Department of Education is really the organization in charge of school reopening. They have had a framework that they've worked on with superintendents and parents and teachers across the state, and that is on the Department of Education website. Um, on that in that framework, you will find a section describing both what will happen, and that's where these color coding for the counties will be, how Maine Department of Health and Human Services and CDC are partnering, but also the clear language of what this is. These categorizations are nothing more than advice. They are trying to kind of give people a sense of what is going on from an epidemiological level at that county, taking into account qualitative information, quantitative information. As Commissioner Maker, Megan has repeatedly said, that's only part of what goes into the decisions that our school districts will make. It'll also include, are they ready? Can their school facility be modified? Are their parents able to kind of help their children, you know, accommodate the new rules and recommendations that are there to keep people safe? So the piece that's coming out tomorrow is just one tool, a baseline tool that we expect our school districts to be able to use as they are making these challenging decisions, looking at their student population, their facilities and the situation in their county as they decide what to do when school reopening serves. So those color codes will be on the Department of Education website to all. That is correct. Okay, and how often are they gonna be updated? As the website says at the Department of Education, they will be updated every two weeks. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I'm gonna turn now to Patty White at Maine Public. Thanks very much, Dr. Shaw. Um, Governor Mills, my first question is for you. The one million in funding to address racial and ethnic disparities, you said it will go to community-based programs. Do you mean, by that do you mean uh, specifically immigrant-run organizations? I think that was something that community leaders had asked for, to, for funding specifically for um, organizations run by members of their own community. Right, there, there were, I met with representatives from five or six different organizations and my impression is that several of them will be up and ready to go, apply for this funding very quickly, and do what they're already doing uh, with our help. I'm not going to name the organizations because we do have a process. Yeah, and I will just okay. add that there are multiple communities in Maine that have experienced significantly higher rates of COVID-19 than their underlying rate of rate of population or re residency in Maine. So we are talking with numerous organizations from different types of communities across the state. So it'll be, I think, a number of organizations. And I do want to actually correct something I said earlier because I just realized I misspoke. Going back to Northern Light and their swab and send sites, they are doing more of a soft launch with some sites open on Monday for some appointments. So all 10 sites will be phased in, but they won't all be open on Monday. And I'm sorry for misspeaking. Great, thanks. And then I've got a question, another question about schools reopening. And um, I know the state has released guidance and the color coded map is coming out tomorrow. Is the state also looking at doing surveillance testing in schools, even in you know certain counties where the, the case count is higher? I've heard some people say that even using less accurate tests like the rapid test that can be, those can be effective for kind of broad surveillance. Is that something the state is looking at? So it's, it's, it's under discussion, both from a scientific perspective, as well as from an operations perspective. Uh, I've had conversations with colleagues of mine uh, across the country, as well as with folks at the US CDC to see what we would make of the data. What we know about COVID-19 in children, especially children less than 10, is that their rate of having the disease carrying the virus is lower. Thus their rates of having clinical illness from COVID-19 are lower. Um, so we've, we're thinking about how to think about testing. Should it be students? Should it be others? And then how would we operationalize that? What types of decisions would be made based on that? Nothing has been decided at this point. There's a lot of discussions, scientific and otherwise, that are underway. Uh, and we're, we're trying to kind of get a sense of where the data go and how we might uh, take that and what decisions we would make as a result. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And the final question of the afternoon goes to Patrick Whittle from the AP. Thank you very much. Uh, earlier today, uh, you uh, shared some scientific studies about the role of sunlight in 
uh, helping reduce exposure to the virus. I'm wondering if you could potentially uh, expand on that a little bit and uh, talk about what role that could possibly play in any in, in the way the state approaches this as we come out of summer. And sure. also, also um, I, I could be mistaken about this, but I, I think the last day of the civil emergency is August 6th. I'm just curious if we're looking at it likely being extended again. Well, I can answer the last question first, if you don't mind. Uh, Please. We, look at, we look at the state of emergency. We look at the reasons and the causes of the state of emergency. We look at it every day. And we look at what's happening around us and the rest of New England and the Northeast and elsewhere in the country. And I talk with my, my compatriots in the governor's, National Governors Association uh, to see what actions they're taking. I don't believe any of them uh, have actually removed the state of emergency. But we're looking at the data that uh, and the scientific uh, medical advice, public health advice that has counseled us all along to determine whether or not that emergency status should be continued. Patrick, as to your former question, uh, a little while ago, a few months ago, there was an initial paper that came out from some Japanese researchers that in general found that the risk of transmission of COVID-19 in outdoor settings was about 18 to 19 times lower, not percent, but times lower than in indoor settings. So that introduced the hypothesis that outdoor activities were safer. There's been a lot of research that's tried to characterize the mechanism of action behind that difference. Why is it that outdoor activities could conceivably be safer, all other things being held equal? The two papers that I tweeted about the other evening suggest that one factor could be ultraviolet light. Uh, the ultraviolet light seems to deactivate the virus, whether it's on a surface or whether it's hanging in the air after X number of minutes, depending on different conditions. And the papers detail that. These papers don't answer the question of whether there might be other forces at play that could also be working to reduce the risk of outdoor activities. That could be a breeze that's blowing the aerosols. It could be the fact that folks are naturally more spaced out when they're, apart, when they're outside. Those, those other factors are still being characterized by scientists. But what I think is really important caveat behind all of this, Patrick, is that it does assume that the nature of the outdoor activity is the same as the indoor activity. If a bunch of folks crowd into a small, small space the mere fact that they're outdoors may not prevent COVID-19 transmission. So the factors that we've been talking about since, gosh, since April or May now are just as important outdoors as they are indoors. Those are the duration of the activity and the density of the activity. No amount of outdoor activity, no amount of ultraviolet light, no amount of wind will prevent transmission if folks are packed together in a tight space for a long period of time if someone there has got COVID-19. The, the likelihood may be lower, but it does not fall to zero. So the same things we've been talking about for months now, staying spaced out, limiting interaction, wearing face coverings, they still apply in outdoor settings just as they would in indoor settings. So thanks for that question. And Governor, that was the last question for this afternoon. So I'll turn it back over to you. Well, thank you, Dr. Shaw. Thank you, Commissioner Lambrew. Thank you all members of the press. And and our, our interpreter, um, I, it's snack time for me. Dan Brennan, if you were here, I'd, I'd, let, I'd give you one of these for your three o'clock snack. Um, I'll have one waiting for you next time I see you. Um, so uh, <laughs> from Wilbur's Chocolate to you, thank you so much, all of you. Thank you for listening. And thank you, Dr. Shire and Commissioner Lambrew again, and Dan Brennan from Maine Housing for all you've done to help us out in the last few months in particular with the special and urgent housing needs of Maine people. Thanks. Have a good one. Thanks everyone.